Next thing we're going to look at is doing a local failover. Now here we can see we've got our example environment again. In this particular example, we're going to have a local virtual server fail. And then we're going to bring that virtual server up on top of the appliance. And we're going to look at the steps that an administrator would go to to be able to bring that server back up. So to show you guys the server's failing, I'm just doing a simple ping to the server. We're going to see now that the request is timing out. So we can see that our web server has come offline. Once we know that we need to do something, we're going to log into the dashboard. And now we're still going to go to manage DR sites and appliances, but we're going to pick the appliance that has the backups for the server that we want to recover. So in this particular case, we're going to Thor. We're going to say manage primary. And now when we log in, we're going to see, again, on the jobs history, we're going to see a lot more jobs. We're going to go ahead and go over to our boot tab. And here we can see we've got servers grouped into boot groups. Now, boot groups is just a, a way to put together, you know, here's some Linux servers, here's some database servers that we want to be able to power on all at the same time. Here we can see that we've got our web server. We've got 14 recovery points. We tell it we want to boot up. And we can see here by the icon, if it's got this, that means it's a synthetic full. If it's just got the kind of checkerboard out there, then that's an actual full backup. And again, we can boot from any of those points in time, and they're all independent. So a lot of people, when they're doing those synthetics, if any piece of the chain breaks, it breaks the whole thing. We don't have that issue. How, oh, sorry. I know you wanted to keep going. I'll wait till you're done with the video. Is it quick? <laughs> OK. Not now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so on the next screen, we can look at and we can see you know, what resources are we going to throw at this? How much RAM do we want to give it? How much CPU? What network do we want to boot it on? So this is where we could boot it off network and do some testing or recover some files. Now we come over and we look at the activity. And here we can see on our active screen that it's currently building this VM. If we click to refresh, we can see now that we've got a screen preview, basically a console view at the right of what's happening. And we do create that console connection via VNC. So we copy that password. We connect over to it. We paste it in. And now we're on the console of that web server. We can see it's already fully up and booted. But if we wanted to do anything here, we wanted to do any testing or anything, this is where we'd be able to do it. Now we can see it's responding to the ping requests here. But that's how easy it is to recover from an outage. One of the other things that a lot of our customers use the on-prem appliance for is to boot stuff up on top of it and test patching, configuration changes, and all that. If you think about it, this is the best sandbox lab environment. It's got the most recent copy always of your servers. So it's nice to be able to boot that up and be able to do your testing. How granular can you make RPO? So how many times do you take snapshots? Uh, it's really going to be dependent on what the environment can handle. But how so, small could I make it? How could I have, like, when, when you configure it, you can go down as small as you want to. The smallest one we have is hour, but you can actually say you want one at the top of the hour, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. So are you translating the VMDKs into something different to run on a different hypervisor? Yes. And then there's no problem with the data integrity to shut it down, that kind of stuff? Mm, you can shut it down, restore it back to your uh, original environment. OK, because there's a lot. If you look at the ratio of how many VMs you want to start up in your sandbox, you know, compared to the super dense environments, that, and your CPUs on your, your grid didn't show them to be super powerful. We do have options to put more CPUs in. OK. You mentioned uh, database aware backups like SQL Server and Oracle. Is it possible through the, through the portal or through the software to do a database restore without having to recover the entire VM? Absolutely. So even though we're doing disaster recovery style backup, uh, image-based backup, we do have the application aware agent. So if you're doing VMware, you would have to back it up as an application style backup. So you put the agent in there, then we would back it up through SQL or uh, Exchange. And then when you go to do the recovery, you actually got three options. One is restore the component files, the VMDKs. Two is granular. So we can go out and restore individual files and folders. And the last one's application backups, where you would pick the application and the point in time and do the restore that way. <laughs> um, 
So when you back up VMs, you are using the VMware snapshots and then you're copying it off. Have you had any problems with customers having their VMs stunned from being snapshotted? Like, well, this is the like pausing. Sometimes when you take snapshots, it kind of slows things down a little. Have you had any problems with that? There's been rare instances, but usually through configuration changes, we can get around that. Because we can throttle how many VMs we're doing at once. We can schedule everything. So that's usually something that can be easily worked around. Now, one question would be, why would we recover local? We've all been in the industry for a while, so we all have probably got our own examples in our head of why we would recover locally. Um, one of the reasons that I like to point out now is with ransomware becoming more popular and more prevalent in the environments, it's nice that we have that ability to boot up from any point in time. So as you're troubleshooting through, where did everything get encrypted? Where did this problem come from? We can roll back and look at each individual point in time so you can get the most recent non-encrypted copy of the data.